Good day, and welcome to the first of the 2019 winter webinars from the Sir James Dunn Animal Welfare Centre at the Atlantic Veterinary College in Prince Edward Island, Canada. I'm Dr. Alice Crook, coordinator of the centre, and I'm excited that we have registrants from far and wide again this year, including many of you who have registered again from last year, Canada and the US, European countries, Australia, New Zealand, and the Caribbean. I want to extend a particular welcome to those returning webinar attendees and also to ABC alumni in the audience, as well as to the many vet students and AHT students from many different schools. So welcome to you all. Before I introduce our presenter, I'm going to go over a few things so you will know how to participate in today's event. First, it's a good idea to close all unnecessary programs or apps running on your computer. We have taken a screenshot to show you what you will see on your own computer desktop. Taking up most of the screen is the GoToWebinar viewer through which you will see the presentation. In the upper right is the GoToWebinar control panel where you can choose the audio mode and where you can ask questions. By default, you are listening in using your computer's speaker system. If you'd prefer to listen over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Note that your control panel will collapse automatically when not in use. To keep it open, you can click the view menu, which is there, and uncheck auto hide control panel. Here's a closer look at the control panel and how you can participate. You've all joined in listen only mode, which means you are muted. However, we welcome your questions at, or comments, which you can submit at any time by typing them into the question pane. Uh, we'll collect them and Dr. Overall will answer them at the end of today's presentation. But as I said, you can send them in at any time. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be sent to you in a follow-up email from GoToWebinar within a few days. And all paid registrants will receive a CE certificate within about a week of the last webinar. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Overall. Um, Karen Overall has given hundreds of national and international presentations and short courses and is the author of over 100 scholarly publications, dozens of textbook chapters, and the text Clinical Behavioral Medicine for Small Animals and Manual of Clinical Behavioral Medicine for Dogs and Cats, and of the DVD Humane Behavioral Care for Dogs, Problem Prevention and Treatment. She's the editor-in-chief for the Journal of Veterinary Behavior, Clinical Applications and Research. Dr. Overall is a senior research scientist in the biology department at the University of Pennsylvania, where she studies the effects of anxiety and re reactivity on performance and mental health in dogs. And now it's my pleasure to change over to you, Karen. Great. Okay, let me just, uh, Okay, you should be able to see that. Can you see that, Alice? Yes, there's your three Perfect. dogs. And the three dogs, and those are three rescue dogs, which is why they're in that photo. So uh, we're going to talk about um, what we really need to think about when we, we see these rescue dogs and how, how we can help them. So this is a very practical uh, behavioral and welfare concerns for rescue dogs because this is becoming, for many of us, uh, a much bigger issue and it's becoming a big issue for specialists. Um, I think we should ask what's a rescue dog. That could be a dog in breed rescue, and uh, one of the dogs in the picture there that you saw, the female on the right, came from a breed rescue. Could be a dog in a shelter or a rehoming facility. Um, the other two dogs came from shelters or rehoming facilities. Could be a dog in uh, a private rescue uh, that specializes in specific types of dogs or specific situations or specific types of rehab. And one of the Canadian ones that's been in the news lately is Hearts of the North. It could be a dog from a veterinarian where the people didn't want the dog anymore and, and vets um, not infrequently taken dogs or cats and you know they know they can find another home, somebody's lost a pet. And, and most veterinarians don't wanna be in the business of rehoming dogs, but they certainly, you know, compassion often takes over. A dog from a person who doesn't want it anymore. I mean, there have been people who've just said, I don't want this dog. Will you will you take it? And then we are increasingly, and this scares me, 
seeing people who are getting their dogs from places like Craigslist and Kijiji, and I just, buying a dog online is never a fantastic idea. But a secondhand dog from a place like Craigslist is a real adventure. So um, when you talk about what a rescue dog is, you have to realize that all of these dogs have very different experiences. Many of the people who are working in these facilities, and I'll, I'll use my laser pointer, many of the people who are working in these facilities don't have the same degree of experience. They don't have the same degree of education or access to veterinary care. Most dogs in shelters and rehoming facilities at least have some access to veterinary care, but they may not have any access to behavioral care. The rescues in our area frequently call on me to give them help with a specific case. And when I walk in, I'm thinking, what made this one dog special? There were hundreds of dogs here who could use exactly the same advice. There are very few places that are uh, rescue rehoming facilities that um, will offer behavioral advice or behavioral evaluations for all of their patients, but they exist. And places like Dogs Trust in the UK, which has um, more than 20 residential rehoming facilities, it's not an open access shelter, but those dogs, once they're in that system, are there until they're adopted or until they die. And they have uh, boarded specialists who work with them. They bring in expertise. They have a trained behavior person at every single site. And the dog's welfare is paramount. So that's sort of the top-notch thing. And then there can be a whole host of other other very well-intentioned people, often doing things that may or may not be helpful. And my take home message for this aspect of this talk is, it doesn't matter how many resources you have, you have to do this as well as you possibly can. And the standard of care isn't as well as you possibly can, it's to meet the dog's needs. And in order to meet the dog's needs, the minimum standard of care requires that you have veterinary advice for all of the medical conditions and everybody who's doing any kind of rescue needs to realize that what that just the process of taking a dog or a cat out of a home and putting it into another or putting it into a foster or holding it at a facility is mentally and psychologically and emotionally traumatic and you need somebody who can help you with behavioral problems because chances are that's many of the reasons that went into why these dogs aren't in their home anymore. And you can develop a relationship with somebody who has a special interest in behavior. ABSAB, the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior, is the North American group that has hundreds and hundreds of vets who have special interests in behavior. You can reach out to any of the hundred specialists in North America. Um, many of those specialists have relationships with shelters. A few of them work at places like the San Francisco SPCA, for example. So there is a precedent for this, but the standard of care here really requires minimally that you get veterinary intervention. And those vets can often call a specialist if they need additional help. But if you can, reach out to somebody who knows about behavior. So why do people relinquish their dogs in general? And this is a study done in Australia. And there are two sets of reasons that the authors identified. One was an owner-related set of reasons and one were dog behavioral reasons. Um, if you look at the owner reasons, everything with a red asterisk has a behavioral component for the dog. So if you think about this, um, owner health and personal reasons. Um, well, if you're arthritic and older, it may be taxing for you to have a puppy. Uh, too much work, effort, time, that's a mental and physical stressor for humans. Um, didn't choose the dog, you know, uh, and if you didn't choose the dog and you don't like the way it looks and you don't like the way it behaves, you won't keep it. Welfare issues for the dog, that's a behavioral issue. How many people love the thought of border collies? <clears throat> but may not love the border collie. This is a, a major issue. It's very difficult for most people to have dogs that are as smart or smarter than they are. And it's certainly very difficult for most people to have dogs that are nonstop energy. Border collies may not be nonstop energy, but Jack Russell Terriers also have the problem. Terriers in general, uh, you know, have a different personality profile. I, it, I did research with some of our laboratory dogs once and 
it was a colony that was breeding for a specific set of illnesses to study the molecular genetics of them. And they had the world's nicest dogs. They were, they were groomed all the time. They were fawned over. And one of the people who worked there once said to me, look at her. She uh, doesn't move very well. She's older. She's mostly blind. Um, she's the perfect pet for the average person because she's not a challenge. And yet no one would adopt a dog like that. But that's many, in many cases the dog some people need. Um, a mismatch could be behavioral, could be physical, but often behaviors involved. Issues with children, whether kids are threatened or um, bitten. Uh, wrong decision. And the wrong decision comes because the reason we grieve when we lose our companion animals is because of who they are and their behavior determines who they are. And the reason we may have trouble loving some companion animals is because of their behaviors and it's a wrong decision. Not fitting in with the family, again, generally behavioral and unrealistic expectations. People who want, um, think they want an agility dog, we're going to have a rash of that now because the Westminster Kennel Club show has been showing the agility events. Um, and they go out and they get an agility dog and then they discover they actually have to run around the agility course with them it's a problem. You've got to have realistic expectations all around. And veterinarians have a real role to play in helping people with this. And for years, I encouraged them to do pre-purchase exams and, and trained people in how to do this. And then we realized we never got anybody coming in and asking advice. So all these veterinarians were all ready to offer all this great behavioral pre-purchase advice, and no one ever asked for it. So um, dog behavioral reasons, reasons include things like the dog escapes, they're too active or boisterous, they may mouth, um, or house training. And I will tell you something, that if you want a situation that'll get a dog bounced out of a house in no time at all, a dog who is not house trained will get dumped very, very, very very quickly. And the clients may perceive that it's house training when the dog has separation anxiety or a bladder infection. The female on the right that you saw in the first slide, and you'll get to see more of her in this presentation, um, she wore a shock collar in a year and a half because the owner uh, assumed that she was just impossible to house train. And we got her when she weighed uh, one third of her body weight and was a couple of weeks from death when he was ready to relinquish her. Um, and she had a shock collar on her then because she eliminated in the house and she eliminated in the house because she has a genetic defect that prevents her from digesting proteins. She has exocrine pancreatic insufficiency and no shock collar in the world is gonna fix that. So here this dog was abused for a year and a half because people perceived that was a house training issue. Barking, uncontrollable, uncontrollable is not a diagnosis. Uh, and uncontrollable may not pertain to the dog at all, but if the people perceive the dog as uncontrollable, which could translate to young, energetic, bold, you know, if that was a working dog, um, the boldness that would make it a great working dog may not make it a great pet for you. Um, anything people perceive as destructive, and they often get this wrong. I've had clients bring me dogs that where they tell me they're destructive. And in one case, I, I, I couldn't get where this dog was destructive. It was perfect during the appointment. It destroyed nothing we gave it. And the client said, oh, but of course he's destructive. I come home and he's knocked all the pillows off the, off the sofa and the chairs. Now that was enough to make that person think that they should abandon that dog. Uh, the dog digs in gardens, in, um, in the floor. And this is the diagnosis here, separation anxiety where dogs vocalize, they destroy, they eliminate, um, they salivate, they pace, and neighbors complain. And a lot of dogs who have separation anxiety are relinquished. I didn't mention predatory behavior, but People are afraid of predatory behavior and they think that it will lead to predatory aggression where children are injured. It does not. But also people are not in love with animals who hunt. So this can be a problem. It's the only condition in this list of reasons to relinquish dogs that have to do with their behavior that is not worsened by being put in a shelter. Every one of these situations, sheltering can actually make worse. And in a study that was done in 2013 um, and published in JAVMA, 
veterinarians were surveyed um, to see what they thought their clients would adopt. You know, how adoptable are these these dogs that are in shelters and rescue dogs? And it's interesting because so many of their patients' dogs were rescues that um, they were fine with any aggression that's fairly mild, um, even moderate play aggression, which can be pretty tough. Pain aggression, fear, fear aggression can be very difficult for some people to handle, but you know, as long as anything wasn't severe, they felt that the average person who was interested in a new dog and would consider a rescue wouldn't have any trouble. So behavioral conditions per se are not impediments to adoption. Severe behavioral conditions can be impediments for adoption. The take home message here is behavioral, behavioral problems are time penetrant conditions. You really wish to treat these as early as possible. And if you are going to shelter an animal who has a behavioral condition, be mindful of which conditions are likely to get worse, which is pretty much all of them, and start treating the dog with behavior modification and with medication during the sheltering period. Uh, that's the way you shove a severe case into the mild and moderate category and get it adopted. In the same study, when they asked, what would you be willing to do for a dog? Basically, everybody said, well, I'll give it eye drops, I'll give it pills, I'll take it to a vet, I'll feed it a special diet for a month. They'll do all these things. So having a behavioral condition or having a special needs condition isn't an impediment per se to adoption. Um, I served on the, sh the board of our local shelter for uh, six months, which was, it was an open access shelter where um, I was appointed to the board by the, the uh, governor and the uh, congressman for the state, along with a bunch of other people. And our task was to clean up this operation where too many animals were dying. And six months later, we all quit as a group because um, we... We did not replace the old people, and uh, it was a, a bit of a nightmare. But one of the things that we were able to do was to treat the dogs who had and cats who had behavioral conditions that were apparent. And these weren't just the ones that came in. In fact, those were the exceptions. So, you know, somebody would turn in a dog with separation anxiety, fine, we can treat that. But these were dogs who were going to end up dead because they were not doing well in it in a sheltering situation. So much against the uh, wishes of some of the board members who were from the old guard, we treated these dogs aggressively with behavior mod and with behavioral medications. And not a single one of them ended up dead. They all got homes and all of the people were willing to take the behavioral meds and the behavioral protocols home and work with them. And they got letters that went to their vet and it made all the difference in the world. So in fact, you can treat dogs in a sheltered situation and we, we ought to be doing more of it. Part of the problem is though, people don't recognize when the dog's in trouble. If we consider this oval to be the universe of all the behaviors that dogs will exhibit. And we look at the far left side, these would be the normal behaviors, these would be the less normal behaviors, and these, by the time you get over here, you're into the truly pathological behaviors. The problem is dogs vary, and the extent to which the variation occurs depends on interactions between the learning and the behavioral environments and any limitations that might be posed by the genetic environment. And I'll give you an example of a limitation imposed by the genetic environment. Um, I have a colleague who sometimes advises sports medicine people and he had been doing a long distance um, consultation with someone who was interested in how to really get her dog to go over the agility course more forcefully. And this went on for months. And finally he said, I need for you to come to the university and see me. I can't, this isn't getting us anywhere. I really don't have any perspective on, on what's getting missed here. And as soon as the dog walked through the door, he knew what the problem was. The dog is a basset hound. It's never going to do brilliantly well in agility. That's a genetic environment limitation. With behaviors, um, the things we've already talked about, like being active, herding behaviors, terrier-like behaviors, the tenacity that terriers exhibit, 
being a terrier doesn't mean you'll be tenacious, but you need to know that when we asked things to be terriers, we selected for tenacity as part of what goes with the breed group. So the risk that you may exhibit some of those more breed or group typical behaviors is greater and people need to understand what that means. So if we've got normal dogs that people aren't happy with in a shelter in, or in a in a rescue situation where they're in their new home. We just have to let people know that those are normal behaviors and we have to just educate them and encourage those behaviors in circumstances that the humans find palatable. If those dogs are exhibiting slightly less normal behaviors, we have to educate the client. We may have to say, well, this dog worries a little bit about this. Maybe we need a different environment. Maybe you can't put that dog in that situation. Maybe you can't let your children just run around and jump on this dog. After all, it's a dachshund, it has some disc problems. And we'll start them on true behavior modification so that they learn to communicate with the dog. Everybody thinks good cognitive-based behavior modification programs are about changing the dog's behavior, and they are. But they're really also about changing the human's behavior and building that trust, building a contract that says that you will be a reliable human and here are the rules of engagement. And when you're a reliable human, you will do your best to understand what that dog is trying to say and ask of you. And that's why we do those things. Um, by the time we've got a truly abnormal or pathological patient, and these are mostly what I see, and I give the people who bring these dogs to me, these rescue dogs to me credit, by and large, they, like us, when we took the lovely Missy Rose, they knew what they were getting into. They're taking a dog who was traumatized in a hurricane. They're taking dogs from Puerto Rico. They're taking dogs who were former puppy mill breeding dogs. They're taking dogs um, who were raised in puppy mills. Um, and at that point, we're we really need to talk to them about neurochemistry, about diet, about brain development. But we also have to redress the pathology, which is going to be true behavior modification plus medication. And this is a project. And not everybody wants a project. As somebody once said to me, most people want pets. They don't want projects. Well, if they're of a, a, a personality type to take on these individuals, I'll tell you something. Um, these are the dogs that make you better people. They're not the easy dogs. These are the dogs that will change the way you look at the world and uh, broaden your horizons, but it's not for everybody. We have two main classes of rescue dogs and um, I need to define them because I need to explain how they differ in terms of what's going on in their brain. And then we're going to talk about what interventions you would use for each of these sets of dogs and what types of conditions we're likely to see with these dogs. Um, and then we'll take questions. Uh, we have adults who have been abandoned or have had awful experiences, and sometimes they were dumped in a shelter or rescue, sometimes they were found on the street, sometimes tragedies happened, um, there was a flood, there was a fire, there was an earthquake, they end up in shelters. Uh, here the concern is that these individuals probably had normal neurodevelopment, that's our assumption, but that they had something bad happen to them. Their people ended up starving, they were broke, they became homeless, the dog became homeless. Uh, the dog was caught in one of the very bad floods that the Southern United States has had this past year, or in the Puerto Rican hurricane, and things came crashing down and the dog was stranded and hungry for days. But we assume that those dogs had normal neurodevelopment, and that may not be true. So we assume that there's something horrible, and it could just be the rupture of the relationship that was horrible. This is very different than pups who have never had good or stable homes. So dogs four months of age and under when their brain is still rapidly developing, and four months is not an ironclad cutoff. But um, dogs who have come from commercially bred moms, I'm sorry, commercially bred dogs, moms who were in shelters, moms who were pregnant when they were brought to the shelter and give birth in the shelter. These are dogs that are going to likely suffer the effects of epigenetic stress. And this is the result of what an uncertain and stressful environment does to you prenatally, 
at perinatally and postnatally in terms of nutrition and neurodevelopment. So we are really concerned about how this affects their neurodevelopment, including all the epigenetic effects, plus the trauma that they would have and any neglect or distress. So these dogs, really, these puppies are really far worse off than the adult dogs, although everybody wants puppies and everybody thinks puppies are flexible. And those dogs come to me in the dozens and they are shockingly damaged and people have no sense of what they're getting into. And they have been given bad advice because everybody thinks a puppy is recoverable. And the advice was well-intentioned, but all of this, and I'm not the only specialist seeing this, specialists in North America are deluged with these dogs as people bring up caravans of dogs from, from states in the United States and provinces in Canada that have commercial breeding facilities. So let's talk about what happens to the pathology. Pathology in behavioral medicine is interesting because especially for for these dogs who have horrible things happen and may have also had neurodevelopmental issues, we have to ask um, what they're, what the, to what are they being exposed? And if you've got neurodevelopmental issues, you're already going to be more reactive because you've been exposed to stressful things already. What's your experience? Have you had any good experiences or have there only been bad experiences? And how long have you had good or bad experience? So, so what's the duration of your experiences? What's the duration of the exposure to the stressor? And if you multiply those three together, that gives you a dosage of trauma that will contribute to the pathology. And the age at first insult is uh, basically a multiple of all of those. So you can look at these young dogs and say, how long has this been going on? What experience did they have that might mitigate this? And what was their risk in terms of epigenetic effects for exposure? And boy, you can tell the age at which they started to be affected. So when we look at rescued pups and rescue moms, I think we have to be very, very, very careful. The research I'm about to talk about is largely from the rodent literature, but it's now being demonstrated in humans. I, um, I don't see the studies yet being funded in cats and dogs and horses, but I know they could be funded. And the reason people use rodents is you can have large numbers of animals and manipulate genes and manipulate the litter size. Um, but from these studies, we know that prenatal and chronic ongoing stress, and this is in rats, leads to lower levels of extinction of Q-conditioned fear. So I want you to think about the history of commercially raised pups or pups who were born in situations where the mom is homeless or the mom is in a shelter or the mom was caught in a natural disaster. So I want you to think about what Q-conditioned fear is. A stranger? a noise, a sound like the wind, some tactile circumstance like the water rising. So think about these puppies' history. When the you've got this ongoing stress, you shrink the hippocampus, which are the red parts here, of the brain. Those are the parts of the brain involved in associational learning. So an example would be sit, good girl. They sit, they make the association between the verbal reward. and if you shrink these areas, you get subsequent memory impairment. So early learning is already impaired because you have more trouble learning simple things. You also faci facilitate fear conditioning, not just to the cue condition fear, but in general, because you end up with problems with how the amygdala reacts. The amygdala is the part of the brain that you need to make smart decisions about what to be fearful of. So in other words, um, some fears are adaptive. Not walking out in front of traffic is smart. Not running through a hail of bullets at a shooting range, no matter how good a sportsman you are, is smart. Uh, not putting your hand into an open flame is smart. 
and fear plays some role in avoiding those risky circumstances. But you get a facilitation of fear conditioning in the amygdala. You get a much more reactive amygdala, um, especially for things like auditory fear conditioning in these stressed rodents. So these rodents tend to react to a greater range of noises. They react for a longer period of time, and they have more abnormal behaviors when they're exposed to the noises. I think we see the same thing in these dogs. And finally, in some genetic environments, these are, these effects are these epigenetic effects are far more pronounced. But I want you to ask yourself how careful selection for healthier dogs has been in the rescue dog population. You know, thanks to excellent ways to evaluate hips and excellent ways to evaluate some genetic cardiac defects and excellent ways to evaluate some heritable eye defects. Really good breeders and breed clubs now say, mm, we won't take a hip score that's not within these bounds. So we would really like you not to breed dogs that don't have hip scores in these bounds. And if you've got a system where people can register their dogs, as most of the Scandinavian kennel clubs do, you can monitor who's the better breeder. Um, you can do some of that in North American kennel clubs also. Um, you can select against carriers for eye diseases, for carriers for heart diseases, and good breeders and good breed groups are doing this. That's all wonderful, except nobody is selecting for what makes a good pet or by and large better behavior because we haven't quantified it in the same way. And certainly in the rescue dog community, no one's selecting for healthier dogs. In fact, we have, may have relaxed selection for normal dogs and healthier dogs um, in these commercial breeding situations because it's just a mill of lives to get money for, for young lives. And no one is considering this. So in fact, the genetic environment for the rescue dogs may be more risky than the average canine genetic environment out there. I don't know if that's true. It's a hypothesis worth testing and it may confer additional risk. Um, there's a great study, a series of great studies actually that started with Michael Meany in the 70s and 80s, actually the 80s, I guess, 80s and 90s. Um, but this is, this is a derivative from a series of people who uh, built on his work and he's at McGill University. And this is maternal grooming in mice and the role of methylation in the promoter region of the genes that control the glucocorticoid receptor. And, and you can get um, lines of mice, genetic lines of mice that are either high maternal grooming or low maternal grooming mice. Now, mice in general, the field version of a mouse is a high maternal grooming mouse. If you've ever watched mice with their litters, they lick, they move, they they pick them up, they roll them over, they're always sniffing, they're always poking, everybody's always in a little ball. They're very, 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 very touchy-feely and very licky and very groomy. Um, low maternal grooming mice leave their babies alone. So they're not getting licked, they're not getting poked, they're not getting sniffed, they're not getting picked up and rolled over. In the high maternal grooming line, because of that grooming, you are actually able, you make, you're able to grab methylated groups on the promoter region of the gene. Well, what are methylated groups? They're just a methyl group, CH3 regions that are evidence of damage to cells or neurochemical or molecular processes. And when a methyl group gets into a genetic region, sometimes you don't read the genes the same way you otherwise would have when you go to transcribe them. So here's the promoter um, region and here's the transcription factor for the glucocorticoid receptor. And if you were a high grooming mouse, you are very good at getting rid of the methyl groups. Um, and you transcribe the gene without any problem. You have a normal number and normal expression of glucocorticoid receptors. If you're a low grooming mouse, um, it actually, you have enough methyl groups that it actually interferes with the ability of the transcription factor to bind to the promoter region. So the promoter region has a lot of trouble telling the the transcription process, that it really needs to start making the proteins that the genes for glucocorticoid receptors tell them to make. So what ends up by happening is you've decreased a transcription of the gene that contributes to glucocorticoid receptors, and you don't have that many of them. 
Well, you know, we know that cortisol, the, the uh, quintessential glucocorticoid, increases when you become aroused, when you become upset, when you become excited, when there's a risk. We know that the um, HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is involved. Wouldn't fewer glucocorticoid receptors then be better? Actually not, because what happens in high maternal grooming early in life, you get the activation of the stress response. The stress response stimulates the HPA axis. You get all these glucocorticoids flooding the system. And because you have normal glucocorticoid receptor function, those glucocorticoid receptors now grab all those glucocorticoids and they turn off that response and you don't have very many glucocorticoids sitting around to cause an inflammatory response or a stress response. So you deal with the stress response. If you were a low maternal grooming mouse, what happens is you dump all your glucocorticoids because the HPA process still goes on um, when you're stressed. And when you go to terminate that stress response, you only have a few receptors and they don't function all that well. So you're actually unable to inhibit a stress response and turn it off. And as a result, you're chronically stressed. And that's what we're seeing in these puppies, I think. I think we're seeing that in a lot of these dogs and these puppies that are born in the circumstances I, I outline. This becomes more important than um, many people realize because that chronic glucocorticoid response um, we know that if you've got too much glucocorticoid pre, peri, and postnatally, it interferes with learning at the cellular level. It helps to shrink the hippocampus. So now you've got damage upon damage. Your hippocampus wasn't doing a great job of associational learning anyway, and now it's shrinking. And the real problem is that chronic cortisol elevation acts as a hormone response element. And what hormone response elements do, and you see that this is a glucocorticoid receptor here, hormone response elements uh, block genetic transcription. So what happens when you need to make new ion channels, new neurochemical G-coupled protein receptors, new cell membranes, new mitochondria? You've got to make all this stuff. And we know that when you learn something, you make protein to do it. So when you do this, you have to transcribe protein. And CREB does that. It goes along and it says, I'll read this, I'll read this, I'll read this, I'll read this, I'll read this. And then it hits a hormone response element that's the result of glucocorticoids. And it stops transcribing that protein. So now you may not make a protein. You have more trouble learning. You already had trouble learning. You already had a more reactive amygdala and a shrunken hippocampus. We now give you glucocorticoids that you can't get rid of, and your hippocampus shrinks some more. Now you can't even make enough protein to learn a better way because so much of it gets truncated by the hormone response elements that you're not making functional protein. So these rescue puppies really are in deep trouble. And then there's a fourth thing that happens to them. If they really had a nutritional stressor in utero, and food deprivation, they have, um, they stimulate ghrelin, they stimulate neuropeptide Y, and they have a backdoor to this entire cortical response that sits there all the time. And the problem for these dogs, including the traumatized, neglected result, adults, that links all their concerns is this amygdalic reactivity. And in these puppies, food fits into it, their early experience fits into it, glucocorticoids fits into it, and they all affect anxieties and aggressions. So what are the most common diagnoses that um, we see for rescue dogs? Well, we don't actually have accurate prevalence and incidence data, but when you talk to specialists and when I looked at my records, I am seeing dog after dog with early neurodevelopmental delays, with attendant neophobia where they're afraid of everything or they don't have exposure during their sensitive periods and they have deficits as a result of this. So the, for the first four to six months of their life, maybe they weren't exposed to stuff. Even if they were exposed, they've got neurodevelopmental delays, so they have abnormal responses. People keep exposing them. Now they have a worse abnormal response. They're fearful of other dogs. They're fearful of people. They have food-related aggression. They avoid dogs or people. They have generalized anxiety disorder. They have separation anxiety. They have noise reactivity or phobia. Oh, yeah. And because so many of these dogs were starved and they didn't have access to food, they learned to eat feces. So they're coprophagic. 
These are the things that I see. And it would be the rare dog that I see nowadays that doesn't have some subset of those. And let me give you an example of um, how this how this works. I've got to I've got to turn this off to do this, but I'm going to show you a couple of videos. Um, Linus came from a puppy mill, and this is the lovely Missy Rose who has EPI, and I and we don't manage them this way. This is so you can see the effects of puppyhood on adult dogs. Now I want you to watch Picasso. This is the normal dog here. Both of these dogs were starved. Missy was starved because she lacked um, the ability to cleave proteins. Linus was starved because he was a puppy mill dog who was illegally sold to a pet store at five weeks of age. Um, the pet store sold him illegally to some human at uh, six weeks of age, and he was turned into rescue by seven weeks of age. And it doesn't matter that it's illegal, it damaged him. And he was a vegetable for the first four months of his life. He came to us the day after he came into rescue. This is another normal dog who is leaving. Why? Because the sounds turned down here. But Missy Rose is threatening everybody. My husband's making food just the fact that food is here. She's staring at Linus, he's looking away, he already cares about food, he can't leave. He's growling, she's growling, he's shaking, he can't look at her and she's threatening him the entire time. That's a setup that we would not permit, but I did it to make sure you could see the video. Now I'm gonna show you, let me go back up. I'm gonna show you a second video and this is, a slightly separate situation. And again, notice that pick choose and choose and choose and choose. Here's Missy in a separate situation going around and threatening Linus. And why is pick chewing and chewing and chewing? That's a displacement activity. He knows how abnormal these dogs are and he wants them to ignore him. He doesn't want this aggression turned on him. So this is what you get when those things that I just talked about happen. And these are not dogs for everybody and they're extremely difficult. And if you met Linus today, you would think he was wonderful, but they are difficult. What can we do? We know that once recognized, we should treat specific diagnoses, but you should know that we need to screen every animal the same way to do that. And all vets should be screening for all behavioral conditions using standardized assessment tools that are readily and publicly available. And if anybody wants them, email me and I'll send you some. But veterinarians need to have the sensitivity to screen rescue dogs and know what risks they come with and very few schools in North America teach behavioral medicine to vet students. And that's the big problem. Veterinarians are not using standardized behavioral screens because they have no training. They're not aware of the things that can happen with rescue dogs because they, have the, they lack the training. Um, from the outset, we should follow a set of guidelines that will promote improved mental health. And what are those? Okay, I'm gonna give you five steps and they fall in two ranks. The first rank is the one that I really want you to do first, and the second rank is stuff you can delay. And this is important because it's exactly the opposite of the way most people are doing this and it matters. So address the potential reactivity behaviorally, and this is how we dealt with our dogs. Assess the dogs and protect them if needed and repeat that assessment on a weekly basis, maybe bi-weekly, but it has to be regular. Practice excellent within their comfort zone. Missy Rose almost never leaves the property because that's her comfort zone. At first, she couldn't leave the house, okay? Teach them that they have control over their reactions and how they feel by teaching them to take a deep breath. Just ask them to sit and take a deep breath and reward them when their chest expands. Have them check in a lot and look at you and build trust. This is all part of the cognitive approach to behavior mod. Gradually introduce more complex events. Almost everyone does this too fast. They've got a fearful dog, they keep exposing it. I've got a fearful patient, I tell the people to protect it until that dog can do my 15 page behavior modification program in every single room in the house flawlessly with only the humans he lives with there and only then can they begin to introduce more complex environments. If you have a normal dog, that dog will help you because the dog can model behaviors after a normal dog. Clients' wants and needs may clash with the dogs. They wanna fix these dogs. So when I tell them, if you think you're not going fast enough, slow down, they don't understand this. They wanna help these dogs. You can't 
change these brains overnight. We need to build a better neurochemical architecture for these dogs, and that takes time. And let the dog tell you what he or she wants or needs. So that's the first step, and you're gonna, that's your first rank. You're gonna concentrate on that. Second step is medication now. Do not wait, do not see how they do with behavior mod. Medication immediately. Gabapentinoids like gabapentin, benzodiazepines either daily or for short-term experiences if they have to go to the vet, if, they, if people have to come to the house, if they have to meet other dogs. TCAs or SSRIs like amitriptyline, clomipramine, fluoxetine, escitalopram for dogs who have known anxieties, and alpha agonists like clonidine and dexmedetomidine oral transmucosal gel, which is the newer product Cilio, for dogs who have these explosive reactivities. The difference between a dog for a dog like Missy Rose with something like Cilio, where if she has to meet new people, she's going to start to salivate and chatter and pace. You give her something to control her arousal and she stops chattering and she stops pacing and she's happy to sit and she's happy to look at them. Please, 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 drugs are not over-the-counter pheromonal agents, calming agents, supplements, calming chews, etc. Please do not start with these. You've already got a troubled animal. To delay proven care is to effectively deny it. There are no data that any of these will help. And that matters a lot. Okay. Step three. So what are we going to do for step three? Now, we're into the second rank. These are things you can delay. Good diets with polyunsaturated fatty acids for everyone that'll help with brains. That means increased DHA and EPA levels, especially for young dogs whose brains are developing. You need to consider protein level and source. How debilitated is this puppy? What do they need some special proteins? Beta hydroxybutyrate diets like Purina EN or NeuroCare may enhance problem solving ability in some stressed dogs because they help sequester glutamate, the excitatory amino acid that's responsible for so much of the anxiety. Um, these dogs have to be a little older. The protein level in these diets is not high enough for puppies, but they can be supplemented. Alpha casosapine diets like Royal Canin Calm Diet can help decrease reactivity in some mildly reactive dogs. Again, the protein level isn't that high, so these are older dog fixes. But these come second. These are ranked two. Address potential, <clears throat> excuse me, address potential reactivity with cognitive exercises. Again, this is after you've protected the dog, after you've got them secure, after they're beginning to learn to trust you, and after you've given the medication. Simple things like touch right, touch left, touch up, touch down, turn right, turn left, sit down, up, look, look at that, take a deep breath, nose work. I love these eggs. These are eco eggs found on Amazon. You can compost them. They're not plastic. They're hardy. They're relatively durable. You can't leave them out for dogs when you're not supervising them. But we bury them in the yard with treats in them, and all of the dogs love them. And they'll find them in environments, and even dogs who don't know how to do nose work do this. And focus and tracking make all the difference. Teach the dog that they can get their cues from you. Here's a focus exercise, and this is this is the lovely um, Missy Rose doing this focus. And I'm just holding a toy she doesn't get to play with very often. She actually doesn't get to play with this toy. In front of her, it's yellow, so she can see it. It's a yellow giraffe. I'm slowly moving it, and you can see that I'm moving it back and forth. And you can hear me counting in my head almost. 1, 100, 2, 100, 3, 100, 4, 100, 5, 100. That's how slowly I'm moving this toy. And she's able to track, notice that her pupils aren't dilated, notice that she's taking nice deep breaths. You can see her nostrils flare. Notice she's calm. This is an exercise to get her to look at my face, to look at my actions, to look at me, to monitor a signal. This is a way to make her more normal and she loves it and at the end she gets love and she gets a treat and it makes all the difference in the world and anybody can do this anybody can do this okay here's another example this is the puppy
Okay, and these are simple things that people can do. Finally, what about physical exercise? Again, it's a rank two inter, uh, mediation. Cavalettis, these are great and they're good for their hips and their shoulders. Treat balls, toys for dogs who will play with toys and the more interactive the toy, the better. Walking is great. Swimming is phenomenal. Okay, this is the lovely Missy Rose swimming. And if you don't have access to an ocean or a lake or a pond or a stream, an underwater treadmill can make all the difference because when you swim, not only is this aerobic scope, but the water is pushing against you and in an underwater treadmill, you're actually getting a full body massage. Um, playing with known dogs who are appropriate can help. And treat puzzles that require manipulation. Uh, where the dogs are supervised, but they have to do clever things to get a really desired treat. All of these can give them a lot of physical exercise that'll help. But here's the problem. Most people start with the physical exercise and then maybe they'll do some of the cognitive things and they'll do diet and they've got this completely backwards. They need to protect the animal first to minimize the behavioral reactivity address the reactivity with medication. Do not pass go, do not collect $200, do not do a single thing until you have done that. And only when the dog is well enough can you begin the cognitive exercises and then the physical exercise that's going to take them out of the system. Protection, medication, diet, and learning that they have control over what they must do and how they can feel can allow these dogs to blossom, but it has to be at the dog's speed, not your speed. Um, Young noted that the most devastating legacy that an adult human can pass on to a child is that parents' unmet hopes and aspirations. There's a lot of relevance here for this logic in rescue dogs. People may want to help these dogs, but they need to give that help from the dog's perspective. I know they think they can make that rescue dog into the next agility champ and the next meet and greet king and all of these wonderful things, but maybe that dog just needs to be a couch potato and be loved and happy for the rest of his life. Maybe he won't be able to love them back. And this is the real problem. The thing people have to realize when you take these rescue dogs is everybody's gonna tell you love is enough. And I'm going to tell you, love is never enough. Love is absolutely never enough for these dogs. They need protection. They need medication. And then when they can, they need as much cognitive and behavioral therapy as they can get. And then you have a pretty good chance that they can blossom. The last thought I want to leave you with before we take questions is that what people forget is that we can prevent most of these tragedies. Most of these dogs are puppies that are born in these situations. The adults are dogs that were neglected or dumped. We can certainly prevent all of the puppies and we can prevent most of the adults. Why aren't we doing that? I offered to send questionnaires if people would like standardized tick sheets and questionnaires. These are my email addresses. Um, as Alice mentioned, I edit the journal in the field. Um, if you want to join one of the member organizations, you get the journal at a steep, steep, steep discount. And uh, we offer a residential course for vets and technicians every year at the North American Veterinary Conference in Florida. And this is this year's course. And I'll stop and, and turn it over to you for questions, Alice. OK, thanks very much. Um, so we do have a bit of time. And um, the question panel is open if anybody wants to send in a question. I know this is sort of a heretical way to view this, um, but I learned this from my clients who are all the best intention people in the world. I have the best clients in the universe. And when you give them permission to protect the dog, in some ways they're relieved and in other ways they're disappointed. Um, and they think that the dog won't reach its potential, but no dog can enjoy reaching its potential if it's afraid all the time. Okay, I'm still, I'm not seeing any questions. Amazing. There's um, 64 people on the webinar call, so you think one of you might have a question. 
Usually we have questions, but this, you know, I, it's a heretical approach, but it makes a lot of sense at the gut level. What I don't think people realize is how important that early nutrition and protecting mom from truly extraordinary stress is for how dogs learn and why they have trouble learning if they don't have that fabulous environment. If you want to build a resilient dog, build a resilient mother, you know, make sure they get good in utero nutrition. Make sure that mom isn't starved and isn't beaten and isn't out in the cold and make sure the pups aren't in the same situation. And then what you're doing is you're giving them the components to build a brain that's not reactive if they're hungry, a brain that doesn't have an amygdala that reacts to every single stimulus, a brain with a hippocampus that can learn, and a brain and a body with a glucocorticoid metabolism that doesn't interfere with you doing associational learning, the early stages of learning. Oh, and Karen, now there's some questions coming in. Oh, so great. Here's one. If I start medication first, owners are inclined to blow off the cognitive therapy and behavior modification. I usually have them start exercises for one to, one to two weeks. Yeah, um, maybe. And I say this because I used to do that too. And now I'm putting my foot down. And what I've done instead is I make the exercises relatively simple. So I want them to start with teaching the dog to sit, teaching the dog to look, the targeting, touch right, touch left, the focus. And I have them practice with me. And I tell them why. And I tell them exactly what you just said. So I say, look, it's really important that um, the dog is able to take advantage of these behaviors as soon as they're offered. But these are behaviors that are also going to give you a baseline of how distressed the dog is. And medication doesn't have its effects immediately. Things like gabapentin kick in very quickly and within a few days you might see a less reactive dog and that will build. But if we're talking about using the TCAs, the SSRIs, many of these other medications, benzos in combination with that, those are cognitive neurochemical effects that are going to take a while to build up. So while I understand that people could blow it off, I think if we tell them that story and why they can't, they do tend to get on board a little better and they understand why. Okay. And there's actually now a whole bunch of questions. So of course there have, is. So you have a behavior mod template for these dogs. For I the do. I do have a behavior mod template for these dogs for the owner. And um, I have some programs. Um, the Take a Breath program actually is published and it's got video and it's got a handout and it's got stepwise stuff. And we start with some of the other ones that are published. And I use a lot of Leslie McDevitt stuff because she has pattern games and, and she has a lot of, um, she took one part of the behavior modification program and turned it into a, an exercise called Look at That. Um, and those are second level things. The first thing we've got them to be able, got to get them to do is be, believe it or not, track Missy Rose's giraffe. If they can't do that, they can't do some of the rest of it. But I do have a series of templates um, and I can share those with people. As I said, many of them are already published and in the public domain. Okay, now here's one. What assessment tools should rescues be using to evaluate the dog's when they are received and before they go to foster homes. Oh, can the great question. Part, can the focusing exercise be implemented right away? Um, the focusing exercise can be implemented right away, assuming the dog does not try to remove your body parts and face. And I say that because some dogs, any movement is too much at first. They really need a quiet, darkened space. And one of the concerns that I have with many rescues is the sound level. One of the things that I, I loathed about our local shelter was I walked around with a decibel meter all the time. And when there were humans in there, the decibel meter never dropped below 96, which meant that we were shearing off the hair cells in all of the dog's ears all the time. And that that would make them more sensitive to auditory cue condition fear and less able to deal with it. So I'm a big fan of giving these dogs quiet, darker spaces and um, quiet time, quiet music, let them adjust. But 
the um, just taking some treats, uh, a treat bowl, a treat ball, and then if you can do the focusing, it will work like a charm. Um, what so there was the first part about the assessment tools, right? Is this, what screens do you use to assess these rescue dogs? Um, if the dog is being relinquished and you can get the people to stand in front of you, we actually have an assessment tool for shelters that we use that takes people through the aggression screens, the separation anxiety screens, the um, noise reactivity screens, and the obsessive compulsive screens, all the common things that you might expect dogs to get them booted out of the house. So you can there are some of those, they are published. I'm happy to send them to you if you send me an email. The um, the other screens that you can use is you can just use any standardized set of assessment tools. Um, ours mostly depend on how dogs react in certain situations. So you could, for example, take an aggression screen, and you may not know these for dogs who are not relinquished. And you could start after the dog is settled in and not reactive, start exposing the dog to some of the circumstances. So what would happen if you walked this dog at a distance past another dog? What's the minimum approach distance? And you can begin to learn some of these things from first principles. So the screens become both educational and they become data for how you can intervene with this dog. But very often, if you don't have the human there relinquishing the dog or cat willing to tell you these things. And I think that it's important for rescues because it worked for us and it's worked for lots of places. When you say to people, we're not going to use this against the animal. This is going to help us find them their, their better home people actually will be fairly forthcoming. They know they're relinquishing their pet. Okay, what do you say to clients that just don't want to use medication? Oh, well, what I say to them is that that's fine. I tell them that's fine. They don't have to use it now. Um, I tell them that they can start on this path and I give them the explicit templates and the sets of instructions for start to start. And I tell them that I think it will go faster with medication and that what I would like them to do is go home and try for a week and reconsider and I'll give them all this stuff to read. And 99% of the people I say that to call me within a week and they are willing to try the medication. Uh, you can't force somebody to do something. Now, I have to tell you, my clients are pre-selected, so they're not, I'm not in the trenches. You will have a little more trouble. But what I give people is a sense of what they should be seeing. In other words, I give them a set of behaviors that we should see changed. And everybody has a smartphone now. So it may be that I want them to videotape the dog doing the Missy Rose focus exercise. And I want them to do it on day one, three, and five. And I want them to look at that themselves. If they are not seeing improvement, it's time for medication. And I have a whole series of things like that where you say the dog snarls or barks at other dogs when you go outside. I want you to take the dog out on the lead and get somebody to videotape you. And I want you to ask the dog to sit and look at you every time you're 15 feet away from another dog. And if the dog can't do that and calm, days one, three, five, we need medication. Okay. And that leads, the next question, when, if ever, would you recommend things such as feel away, adaptal, or supplements? Oh, there's somebody out there who loathes me and is asking me this question because anybody who knows me knows I never use pheromonal analog products because Actually, there are no clinical data to support their usage and almost all of the trials that are blinded, in fact, all of the trials that are blinded that have come out in the past five years have not supported their use. So they're tremendously expensive. My clients come to me and um, they've already spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars on products that don't work. And as I said, this is to delay treatment. So pheromonal analog products, I'll, I'll never recommend. Um, I don't think there's anything to them. If people want to use them and they've used them, I need to tell you that 90% of my clients have used those or supplements before they come to see me. 
Um, I'll ask them how they think they've worked. Obviously, they don't think they've worked very well since they're here. Um, and what you can get from some of those is I'll say to people, well, fine, you tried that. And for a supplement, many supplements are herbal. And so they'll have active compounds in them. Many of them now have L-theanine in them which is an active compound that can act very much like an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So if people say, well, I think there was a milder change, fine. What a medication will do for you, what a pharmaceutical grade medication will do for you is to multiply that change and enhance it because it's a much more potent form of a medication that's targeted to do exactly that thing. So people can understand that and will get on board. I will not have any problems with people adding supplements as long as they, if they really want to try it, as long as they understand that any effect may be swamped by the effect of medication, so they might be wasting their money, and they don't have side, potential side effects that could be multiplicative. So in other words, if you've got anything that affects GABA, the inhibitory neurotransmitter like L-theanine, you could have a small amount of sedation. They need to know that if I'm also giving the dog a benzodiazepine, that they could be multiplicative and they need to watch for that additional sedation. I will recommend supplements to debilitated dogs, to dogs who really are not good candidates for medication, to clients who are terrified, truly pathologically terrified of medication. They can try a supplement and we'll negotiate an outcome here. Every all all of these treatment outcomes are negotiated settlements. There is no magic here. This is all hard work and negotiated settlement. And if after a week or two on these, the dog really isn't making any difference in its life. And again, don't forget, I'm giving them these exercises. I'm giving them benchmarks. I'm giving them specific behaviors to watch. I'm not asking them if they think the dog is better. I'm saying, do you think the dog reacted less quickly? Well, you have a video. That dog is still firing as soon as he sees another dog. There is no time delay. We really need to do something here. And then people have given it their best shot. And by then, they're more comfortable. They've talked to other people who've used medications, and it will work quite well for them. So those are the circumstances under which I'll use supplements. There is one exception. I recommend polyunsaturated fatty acid supplements to almost all my patients, not because it will fix their anxiety, not because it'll make them less aggressive, but you'll notice that was in the slides because these supplements tend to help buffer neuronal systems against reactive oxygen species assaults. So every time you get upset, you release a bunch of uh, neurochemical compounds that can be, that can act as reactive oxygen species. You react, you release a lot of glutamate. These are all cytotoxic neurocytokines and neurochemicals. If you've got enough polyunsaturated fatty acids hanging around, they buffer you against the effects of those assaults. And um, I have my patients all take somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 milligrams of those a day. Sometimes it's built into their diet. Sometimes it's a liquid. Sometimes it's a capsule. Depends on the individual dog and human. Okay, here's a related question. Do you have any feedback regarding the new probiotic available for anxiety from Purina? Boy, I knew someone was going to ask that. Um, that probiotic is getting a lot of press and, and there's a lot of enthusiasm for it. And I've had a number of veterinarians tell me they think that it can really help and that it, they think it has helped patients. And here's what I have to say about that. And it also goes back to the pheromonal analog products and the supplements in general. In any double-blind placebo-controlled study, which is what you have to do to take a drug to any regulatory agency. You must have controlled studies where no one knows what the compound is. Um, they're blinded to who got the placebo and who got the compound. Um, you, you've got to be so careful in these. In those studies, the placebo effect can be as high as a beneficial effect for a quarter to a half of all the patients that are enrolled. So the burden of proof that the compound works is quite steep because you have to do far better statistically than the toss of a coin. And my problem with most supplements and most of these other products is they don't subject their own products to that 
to those requirements. You don't have to take a drug to the FDA or another regulatory agency to live up to that standard of care. Most diets, these supplemental diets, Purina, um, EN, Purina NeuroCare, um, the Royal Cane and Calm Diet, they've done the placebo-controlled double-blind studies. They're published. These, these have an effect. All you have to do is the science. You don't have to pay the money to go to the regulatory agency for these. But when you've got 25 to 50 percent effect in a placebo group, you have to be very careful. So when a veterinarian says to me, I think it really helped a few patients, I say to them, 50 up to 50 percent of, of that could be a placebo effect. So all of those could have been placebos if, if you're not doing a big study. That said, there are no peer-reviewed controlled published data yet on this product. It has been presented as abstracts at two meetings and the data have not showed up in the peer review literature. So as a scientist, I'm going to withhold judgment. Now I'm going to tell you something from the basic science viewpoint. <sighs> Varying GI fauna has such hope for so many things because you're interacting at the gastrointestinal boundary that, in, that controls cytokines and inflammatory responses. And if we can manipulate gut flora and fauna to help with that, um, that's going to be a major step forward. And I have a number of friends who are actually working on this, including one who does nothing lately but genotype bacteria. And they're looking for bacteria that have sequences that seem to be associated with some of these anti-inflammatory responses. So do I think that this is something that potentially could help? In other words, does it have a mechanism of action that could help? Yes, that separates it from pheromones. There actually is no published mechanism of action for pheromone. So this could potentially help, but are there data yet? No, and I, I'm really looking forward to seeing that initial study either expanded and published or just published itself as the initial study. Okay, so here's one. So for rescue puppies, do you not recommend the same time of so the same type of socialization during sensitive period periods as for instance dogs from a good breeder? I always think lots of intros to people, dogs, places during sensitive periods. Yes, isn't that interesting? Um, and I, um, I finessed that in the talk because I wanted to make sure we had time for questions. It depends on the dog. So Linus didn't respond to people. There, you could have introduced him to 5,000 new people and it wouldn't have mattered. It didn't make him upset. It didn't make him want to meet people. He didn't have the cortical brain development to even be able to take advantage of those first few sensitive periods. The one thing Linus was good with was he was good with other dogs because he'd been a puppy mill dog. So as he was protected and he was massaged and he got supplements, he got um, special diets, he got lots of polyunsaturated fatty acids, he got a diet extraordinarily rich in EPA and DHA. Um, he was massaged, he was held, he was held against my chest so he could hear my heart and my voice every single time I made a phone call. Anything to connect him to the world of the living being something other than dogs. I don't know how much difference that made, but at about 14 weeks of age, he began to come along. And by four months of age, he'd acted like he'd known people his whole life. There's a dog who wasn't evincing any fear. I'm seeing these puppies who were so reactive that they cannot respond in the way they would, that if they'd had the right start, and you would expose them. Now, don't forget what a sensitive period is. A sensitive period means that that's the period of time when if you expose the dog to the stimulus, they are best able to begin to take advantage of it and blossom as a result of it. It doesn't mean that it will happen, and it doesn't mean that there's a proscribed time that starts and stops for every dog. It just means that you don't have enough of the right neurons in the right places to begin to recognize 
recognize dogs other than your litter mates as other until you're about five weeks of age. And you can't recognize other species as other until you're about five to eight weeks of age, et cetera, et cetera. So always I'm watching for that response that's not going right. Because if you're exposing dogs to friendly, calm people who may have some interesting treats in their hands and they're just sitting there and the dogs don't explore them, that may be normal. If the dogs avoid them, those are the dogs you actually don't want to expose until you can bring them along and make sure that this doesn't become an aversive and negative situation. And it's counterintuitive. I understand that. But after years of seeing people overexpose and continuing to do something that they didn't realize wasn't working anyway, I realized that this is epidemic and that these dogs need special care. Okay, I'm going to group. There's quite a few questions about medications. So I'm going to kind of group those. So we often use fluoxetine for anxious patients. How long do you wait? What signs are you looking for that there may need to be a dose increase or secondary agent versus changing medication altogether? And how do you decide which medication to use? So that's grouping like several questions. Boy, that's also a whole lecture by itself. So let me give um, let me give you the um, the quick version of this. Um, fluoxetine is a great medication to choose because in the United States, it's inexpensive. I know it's a little more expensive in Canada. Um, there are human forms. There's now a dog form again. Um, Reconcile has been re-released by another company and it's a palatable, chewable form um, in a different range of dosages. It can be compounded. There are loads of things that make fluoxetine absolutely lovely. It's used for lots of things. It has a relatively great safety profile and has an incredibly long half-life once you get started so that if people forget to give a dose, the dog is not going to experience rebound syndrome and crash and burn, which happens with things like escitalopram. Okay, so the more the more new the drug is, the more likely it is that the clients have to give it on a set schedule. And if my clients can't do that, there are certain drugs they can't have, just like humans. So fluoxetine can be a wonderful medication. The downside to fluoxetine is the downside to all of the SSRIs, and that's that they take three to five weeks to begin to cause the molecular changes that are responsible for their action. All of these, all of these medications are actually acting as applied in vivo gene therapy. Um, they work to turn on that protein and learning process that we already talked about so that you transcribe more protein, you stimulate more receptors, you transcribe more protein, you make new receptors, you make new structural elements to the neurons, you make new and better membranes so that your neurons are now communicating better and that allows you to learn replacement behaviors better. That can be absolutely fabulous, but that process takes three to five weeks to begin to show an effect. So you have to go through eight weeks of treatment before you can legitimately call that a treatment failure, with one exception. If the patient is already showing of adverse events associated with fluoxetine, and I will tell you what the big one is. The big one is they become anorectic or very fussy about food. And if they become very fussy about food, very often that goes on over time and you see that they're excluding things and you realize these patients are losing weight. The ones you would prefer to have are the ones that become completely anorectic all at once because there's no missing those. These are not good candidates for fluoxetine. They should not be taking that medication. Find another medication. But otherwise, you're going to have to go eight weeks to find if there's an effect. So what I tend to do is I look at the categories of behaviors that we want to evaluate. Is this dog reacting to stimuli that are only extreme now, or are they still reacting to lower level stimuli? Do they have a lag time now before they react, or do they react immediately? When they react, is there any modulation to their response, or is it all or nothing still? Are they responsive to interventions and interruptions? Can they learn to 
look at that or to sit and take a deep breath or to do some focus exercises or to touch? Are they beginning to incorporate more, incorporate more and more normal behaviors into their daily behavior every day? These are things that you can set up in a series of exercises that the client can test every week or two and make their own decisions. I offer to look at all of my clients' videos. So if they want to take a three-minute video three times a week and send it to me, I'm happy to look at it. They usually don't need me. If they set that video up in a controlled set of circumstances, they know when the dog is getting better and worse. They can count the number of barks. They can measure the amount of time it took for them to ask that dog to sit by the door when another dog was there versus when another dog was absent. They can come home and tell you what was destroyed or how long the dog salivated or cried on the video. I recommend that most of my clients get things like Nest video cameras where they can download the live stream to their phone so that they can find out what's going on. Clients are really excellent at collecting data if you tell them what the data looks like. And my clients get a list of behaviors that I want for them to watch for. And um, that way they can use fluoxetine intelligently. If they don't have the time for fluoxetine or they need an add-on or you've got a very reactive dog, fluoxetine's gonna do a lot for the cognitive component and the anxiety. It's not gonna do a lot for that arousal. It will do a lot for the long-term impulsivity but the actual situational arousal, at that point, you may want to look for something like Cilio, the oral dexmedetomidine gel, which we are now using in large amounts, extra label because it was um, developed for dogs who are afraid of noises. And before I go any further, I need to disclose that um, I helped design the experiments that allowed that medication to be licensed worldwide. I am not unbiased, so I just need to disclose that. But um, we're using it extra label for huge numbers of our patients who have arousal issues. People will give it um, an hour before they're going to leave in the morning if their dog is distressed when they leave. Uh, if the dog likes to run on the beach, but it has to only not do it when there are no other dogs. We're setting up staged encounters, giving it an hour before the dog sees other dogs, going to vets' offices. You can use Cilio, you can use Clonidine, you can use Alprazolam, a benzodiazepine for that. You can use Lorazepam, a much shorter acting benzodiazepine for that. You can use gabapentin situationally. People don't realize that you can give gabapentin an hour or two before some circumstance that might upset the dog will happen and um, you can calm down that arousal. And like Cilio, you can repeat gabapentin multiple times a day. You can pe repeat a benzodiazepine up to every six hours, sometimes four hours in some dogs. Um, Cilio can be repeated up to four times a day. Clonidine can be given up to four times a day. Um, there are lots of choices here. But if I see a dog who has an anxiety-related problem and a huge arousal problem in his basket case, I'm going to give them both medications from the start because one is going to kick in much faster. We use a lot of gabapentin now because it's so cheap, has virtually no adverse events as long as the, the dogs and cats have functioning um, kidneys because the only thing it will affect is proximal tubular function in animals with nephron disease and it will build up in the proximal tubule and that could become toxic. If you're clearing everything well, if you can concentrate your urine, chances are you aren't at risk. And we use a lot of this both every 12 hours, every eight hours, and then extra doses situationally. So I'll do everything all at once. Again, my clients are the best in the world. They're highly motivated. And by the time they come to see me, they know how much trouble their patients are in. Okay. Uh what is your opinion on temperament testing in shelter environments? How accurate can it be in such a stressful place? It's awful. The papers have been published. Um, it's truly no better than tossing a coin. Um, the best you can do, and these are on standardized 
temperament specific behavioral reactivity tests that have been done in the shelter and then in home environments um, with respect to food, with respect to biting. Um, the only one that has shown any hope of being useful for biting dogs is when you use the um, social anxiety and behavioral test. It's a very detailed European test. You have to use it multiple times. And if you get a dog who bites and snaps after the third time you've used it, because they tend to become desensitized to the tests if they were just upset, um, you may have a dog who is at risk for biting. Instead, what people are now recommending, including the people who have been trying to validate these tests, are largely um, things like finding out to what the dog reacts and seeing if you can work with that and letting people know. The shelters, as the question indicated, are so stressful that we may not be seeing the real dog. In fact, the dogs who may be well behaved in shelters may just be shut down and you get them into a happy environment. And if they come out of their shell, they don't resemble the dog at all that the people took home. And the old adage of, you know, you have to wait three months to see what dog you really have can be true. So um, I would not um, put any degree of reliability in those for adopting dogs out. But if you find out that in the course of doing some of these types of evaluations or just using one of the screens and seeing, gee, does he react to food? Does he react to other dogs? Does he react to strange people? If I take him away from cages, does he react to people? If I, if they're big people, if they're wearing a hat, if it's a dog that this dog knows, if it's a little dog, if it's a big dog, you can begin to sculpt out sort of a response surface for these dogs for things they might worry about. And then those are things that can be addressed either then or with the new people. And you have to realize that once they get out of that environment, um, the things to which they reacted in the shelter will probably, um, many of them will drop out. The chances of them adding new things to which they'll react are pretty minimal if you've done a good job. I mean, there may be some stimuli that they would never encounter in a shelter. And that's just the way it is. But um, it gives you a series of potential risks, but not absolute risks. And you need to know that you're going to have huge numbers of false positives. OK, Karen, there's actually a whole bunch more questions, but I think we really need to wrap of it up. Of course there are. <laughs> yep. So what I might do is I might try and um, just summarize these questions and then maybe if you think there's a few key points that you might address at the beginning of next week or something sure. like that, or at sure. the end of next week, or yeah, so let's do that. Um, okay. So thanks everybody for these questions. And um, like I said, we'll try and deal with the ones we didn't get to. So thanks very much for attending our webinar today. Thank you very much, Karen, Dr. Overall for presenting. Oh, and Alice, thank you. This is such a great opportunity for everybody that I'm just very, very happy people are interested. Good. And we hope that most, uh, many of you, in fact, pretty much all of you are planning to join us again in two weeks on March 6th for the next one, which will be, what do we know about common aggressions in dogs and cats? So thank you very much. I'm going to end the webinar now. Bye, Karen. Bye, Alice. Thank you.